welcome to episode 174 of the Access Noise Podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to Neil Finn and Nick Seymour from Crowded House about their new album, Gravity Stirs. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Michael Smith from Belfast-based shoegaze band Virgins. So check it out, and if you like the podcast, Please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating and leave a comment. Iconic rock band Crowded House return with their 8th album, Gravity Stars. In this interview, I take a deep dive with Neil Finn and Nick Seymour about the writing and recording of the album, including new single Teenage Summer, which at the time of recording was called Life's Imitation. We also discuss some of their favourite Crowded House songs, previous albums and lots more. So sit back, relax and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Neil Finn and Nick Seymour from Crowded House. So hi Neil, hi Nick, welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Hello Mark, it's nice to be Hello. here. Hello, great absolute, to be here. Absolute pleasure to have you. I was expecting to talk about the new single, Oh Hi, and the upcoming live shows. And then I checked my inbox this week and there was a stream of a brand new Credit House album. And I couldn't believe it. It was just all too much. I've been listening to That's it. great. I love it. It's everything you would expect from Credit House, brimming with gorgeous melodies and great songwriting. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Great. So we waited 11 years for Dreamers Are Waiting and now Credit House are releasing Gravity Stars only three years later. So why so soon? Is it because you're inspired with the new lineup? What happened? Yeah, essentially, we, we, we got a flow on. Um, eventually, God, it was hard in the lockdown. We Our tours got postponed and put aside, and uh, we took a while. It wasn't like a uh, built around the release of the last record. We had to wait for quite some time to get our satisfaction. But um, having made all those gains on the tour, which you just do, there's nothing like doing a run of gigs to make a band better and having become a better band and... Um, you know, more and more intrigued with what we could then go on to do. Um, it was obvious we were going to make another record and we had the opportunity to start it. And we were about to do Australian tour and we we had to go and rehearse. And we were still, it was still actually in quarantine mode, really, or close to. The gigs must have been back on, but we were very really conscious of not getting COVID. Um, so we went into an isolation sort of situation in a studio right up in uh, Byron Bay, and, you know, just to try some stuff out, we didn't know if we'd get anything, but we got four or five real lovely takes of, which became the beginning and the sort of, you know, some of the key moments of the record. The first song we recorded was uh, Magic Piano, which is the lead song on the record. So um, it took quite some working out, but it got us back into shape. And Magic Piano, it's, the, the, as you said, the, the opening track. And, and it also uh, is the song that has the... The title track, um, I began to sense my own weight walking up the gravity stairs. So what yeah. does that mean? Well, it's actually quite apparent in a way. Uh, I mean, there is a real gravity stairs. We feel uh, we've all, everyone that walks up the particular staircase that's um, next to the place we, we holiday in, um, in Greece feels the weight of those stairs. For some reason, it's much harder to climb them than any other staircase. So it's got some heavy stone thing going on there. And uh, But I think it's... It's, you know, it's just it's obviously applicable to the idea that to achieve the heights um, as you get uh, older and, and you've done things for longer, in a way it takes more effort, but it, it absolutely committed to, to ascending those stairs to get to the bells above, you know, the Temple of Bells. Although, Nick, you're going to have a few problems get upstairs at the Minister here. <laughs> you forget the gravity stairs for you, man. We'll leave you down the bottom. We'll send a little plate full of food down to you. Yeah, see, I was going to add that you know the gravity stairs are particularly noticeable when I've gone to take a holiday at the same destination with Neil. It's usually if you go over to his place, you you're bearing gifts, and the weight of those gifts coming up the stairs to his. Well, that's right. To his, and I've I've carried suitcases up those stairs many times too. So, um. They are connected to Hades and the underworld, um, you know, for sure. You can get a sense of it when you walk up there. And when you were going in to write the album, did you have any ideas what kind of sound you wanted for the album and the kind of songs you wanted to write about? 
kind of make it up as you go along, really. Initially, anyway, you sort of, I have a few things that I've made demos of and I bring them to the band and the band takes hold of them. And, you know, in the course of struggling to get around the ideas and trying to embrace some of the stuff that I've done on my demo, but also letting them breathe, the band creates a sound, you know, and then you let that become the the guide it's really to do with where everybody's at and um the way the band's developed so I, I, I there's no you don't start with a manifesto but about halfway through the process you start to get a feeling for the kind of things that are going to work for this record and um and it has a great was, there, was there ever a oh, sorry were you about to quote no no I, go ahead. I, I i thought you were about to say there is a great brecht quote that uh, oh, no, 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 I, no. I finished my quote <laughs> okay um <laughs> Yeah, did, was there not a brief at a certain point that you said, I want to make a record that doesn't have guitars? Or am I? did I dream that? It might be a dream. Oh, I, you must have dreamed that. I didn't say that. Hell, we've just got two guitar players, and then I've got <laughs> Liam playing guitar and me as well. I would, that would be that's mad. It would, it would be completely as, you know, I want, to make, I want to make a record, but this one I'd like everybody to be – performing on inline skates yeah when everyone in the oh, studio oh that i did say yeah <laughs> maybe maybe that could be the next album <laughs> yeah well i mean if you want to get you know just what it feels like to have an uncertainty underfoot um, <laughs> <laughs> would bring something good out there's a, there's a, there's the record uh, record title uncertainty underfoot yeah good good, good title <laughs> Well, like like every Credit House album, there's always amazing artwork for the sleeves, Nick. Um, and this one, you're obviously paying homage to the Revolver by the Beatles. Is that is that right? Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you say. I mean, I I haven't actually said that, but yes, I mean to to confirm, it is definitely a homage uh, to to uh, Klaus Vormann's cover of the um, Revolver a- uh, album. Uh, I was trying to remind myself of some of the graphics that i did when i was my son's age i I have a 12 year old boy and and uh and he just is continually drawing whenever he's in his 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 room it's it's like he's got the same sort of setup that i have when i'm in um in i knew i had to make this album cover on the fly as well because i knew that well initially we had a deadline that was everything was falling into this deadline of having something out before christmas last year and I thought, well, look, you know, and we were touring right up to that point, doing these um, very short-term recording sessions at the beginning of um, re- uh, rehearsal for a tour or a- at the end of a tour, and uh, and we played a lot that year. Um, so I-, I decided to put together a cover that would fit in my suitcase, and that would mean um, pieces of A4 um artist paper like Fabriano or uh, Archer's Reeve or, or something, you know, a well-made paper that would make me rise to the occasion. And um, and I took photographs of each member of the band with a with my um, phone and and then just doodled in my hotel room most nights after shows um, just to keep me out of the bar, basically, and ended up with a, a, um, a square format of six pieces of A4 um, and it's a lovely piece in itself in in terms of looking at it as a large object but it does i think and, and i had in mind the vinyl uh, sleeve it was d- d- specifically designed for vinyl and uh, and and that revolver album really did mark a point in my uh, arrival at actually thinking of design and um it 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 actually was an inspiration not only orally but uh, visually well, um, in, in bass player's vernacular as well, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. He was a bass player <laughs> as well. Bass you know? player, yeah. So, yeah. no. Uh, since since the the album was announced yesterday, the, the message boards I've been reading, you know, people are going, "Oh, well, the album sleeve looks like Revolver." So then the, the whole album must sound like the Beatles. Oh. <laughs> people can draw yeah. whatever conclusion is. It's, it's probably it could be problematic if they have that expectation. Um, I mean, it's not a million miles away from. Uh, approach of an album like uh, Revolver. It's certainly not, you know, we're not imitating Revolver or attempting to sound like the Beatles particularly. We've had that thrown at us before anyway. Um, but 
in terms of the style of songwriting and the the approach to recording it's you know it's not a million miles away it's yeah i I don't know nick if that if you were meaning to make everyone expect a beatles record when you did that (laughs) not at all that could be a problem (laughs) Oh, we could be facing a big a problem right now. Yeah, yeah. You, you know um, what fans are like? Fans just trying to exact everything and look for clues and everything. Well, they are, yeah. It's, it, yeah, they'll, they'll leave that one alone and move on to something else. In mm. a, I, I think more to the point, uh, I, I was drawn to uh, doing a portrait of each member of, uh, of, the, of the band with a, 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 a kind of inclusion of an iconic uh design into their hair and headdress and um it just so happened yeah that 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 also is what um is part of that class form and illustration um that i liked so much it was a yeah but it is a homage without a doubt and also you know the the logo is based on uh the distill style of um uh, modernist painting and from from Holland it's got a slightly Dutch uh, uh, Dutch modernist deco kind of feel to it so yeah there's a few bits and bobs there's a little bit of Japanese uh, graphic in there as well you know printmaking um, references and uh, yeah it's That's the sort of I like the fact that it's a it's a um, a cover that you actually hold up and 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 you read it like you'll look at it while you're listening to the music. You know that that was significant for me. Like every credit house, in my opinion, every credit house album, it always takes time to reveal itself. So there's lo- mm-hmm. lo- lots of great songs on it, and I'd like to sort of delve into some of my favorite uh, tracks fr- from from the album. Well, the first single you put out was "Oh Hi." It's a brilliant feel good track, and the video just dropped as well, which is absolutely amazing. So why did you decide <laughs> to put that track out first? became it, it it became the one that the record company immediately gravitated towards and i was perfectly happy with with that i think when we when i was making it i was aware it had a certain joy joyousness to it and um a simplicity and the kind of in something about the way that the song fell had a different feeling about it than you know it's familiar in some ways like the opening riff is is very crowded house but it Something about the chorus is, was a little bit different. And I kind of, kind of ablaid all the right things about how you would reveal yourself first. You know, like a a, a, uplift, a joyous feeling is is a great thing to have to to lead out. And um, and certainly the record company were quite. You know, there was never really any discussion. That was just that one. Oh no, that'll be great for us first. And I went okay. And uh, and I went and remade it completely. And the and the video Neil, were they, were they the sort of moves that you used to be able to pull off when you were younger? You no, know, I was, I was <laughs> always, I've always been a not a pretty uncoordinated dancer, and um, I I had the original idea based on my grandson, who was just a really extraordinarily odd dr- dancer. Very, um, very, uh, he's really great, but it's really eccentric and and weird. And I thought, oh, it'd be quite cool to. I mean, the nature of the song is kind of paying. Um, paying uh, homage to the idea of kids and the way they think and learning from them. And uh, so it just seemed like a cool idea to maybe put my head on top of my grandson's body and have his crazy moves. But having him cooperate with that idea was slightly problematical and uh, he didn't really want to go into a studio. I've got some amateur footage of him that I did it myself. And then I'm going to put a piece, a couple of pieces out of that actually. Uh, these people in New York loved the idea and decided to, they found a, a willing um, child to put my head on top of. And initially when we first got the thing back, I was going, Oh, you know, is this going to be too creepy? Is it was something weird about it? But because it's kind of cartoony face, it's not like, you know, if I tried to make it really look like it was my head on a, a kid's body, it might've looked a bit disturbing. Um, no, it's, it's great. It's great. I think it's great. got good humor, and it's you know it's lively and um, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> it is. There's always humor associated with Credit House, you know, so that's perfect. I think so. Yeah. Next single, life's life's imitation. It's a great it's a great choice for the second single. Um, you know, it's all about connection, and and I, and I love the way it sort of builds into the chorus. What can you tell me about that? Um, a lot of these songs had quite long and and, and convoluted. Um, processes attached to them. The first incarnation of the song Life's Imitation came from a jam that I had in the studio months, oh, two, probably two years ago, um, which Elroy was part of, which I um, can't remember who else was there. 
Paul Taylor, our percussionist, was there actually, and there was something about, and then I put a bass track on, on it, um, which at, you hear at the very beginning of the song. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and then it, then the song was quite different initially, and I had a lot of different parts. Actually, the bit in the middle that goes, "I'm here tonight and I'm gone again," was really the, almost the whole song, and then it's been demoted to well subsumed by the rest of it and i just kept finding new bits that went really well with that little feel and and the drum feel was quite distinct the drum feel stayed pretty consistent from that jam as well but then i and then i discovered the little um there's a kind of a, a keyboard it was actually done on a, a mellotron keyboard but it's a guitar sound so you can't tell what it is going do, 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 do. about halfway through that kicks in and that gave me the whole end section vocal idea and so then i kind of stitched the whole thing together a few times and tried it in different ways and then the band played it and we got it and developed quite a lot and then it wasn't quite right so i started messing you know like a lot of the songs were like that it it, it sounds on the surface of it like you know it was too much work but every time we every time i worked we worked on it it got better and uh that song really it's a i think it still feels like a single take you know um and and actually most of it still is, but uh, there's it's been a bit of skullduggery gone on to that one, Mark. Nick, you're 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 based in Ireland, Neil. Obviously, you're you're in New Zealand. You know, so so how does it normally? Is it how does it work? You know, do you do a lot of uh, writing uh, and setting stuff uh, remotely as well o- online? You know, when you when you're putting together an album or new songs. Yeah, yeah. it does. Um, you know, we we are very aware of what happens when we get together physically uh, in the same room and. You know, that's where most of the things are fleshed out. Well, all of the things are fleshed out when we're together and decisions are, are made on the fly and it's a very quick, um, we get to the, the point a lot quicker than what we're trying. But we discovered when we were working um, during the COVID um, lockdowns that we could actually share files and <clears throat> uh, have have the, the the luxury of time to formulate ideas on our own before we submit them to to the band and to the committee um the, 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 the decision making and uh so we've we've ended up working out a, a work ethic that is based on the linear recording when we are all together rehearsing a song fleshing out an arrangement and then possibly uh, and recording that formally and then adding uh overdubs and um uh, sundry ideas remotely you know by 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 uh, uh, sharing uh, pro tools files uh, pro tools sessions adding bits putting them into the a uh, dropbox uh, uh, scenario that can be opened by anybody and added to and you know it's sort of like crowded house wiki multi-track my favorite song on the album is some greater plan it's absolutely fantastic it, it's inspired mm. by your father richard finn's war diary and features your, your brother tim i thought that was very interesting um what, what can you can tell me about that yeah it it uh well it's again that had quite a convoluted pathway too because it was actually a whole the melody was a whole other song uh, with a different lyric for a different purpose, which turned out to not come off. Um, it was like a, we had an idea for a musical. But um, the song, the, the tune and the chords and all of that part of it, I, I kind of knew that it was pretty good. And uh, then as an alternative, Tim uh, reminded me of the story about my dad meeting this girl in a, in a, in a ballroom one night in Florence during the war. and. Uh, she was out of his league, but he went and asked her to dance anyway. And they had a they had a wartime romance for about three weeks, which became family mythology. And my mother would roll her eyes and sort of, you know, go, oh God, I suppose that's how what Nada used to say to you, was it? And he'd, <laughs> speak, he'd say a Riva Dirchi all of a sudden, you know. And uh, <laughs> so but it, it just became um it, it was a spark for the song and um the idea of redemption. Uh, you know, when all things look quite dark and he was at the end of the war and he, had, he his father was sick at back in, at home and um, he had this beautiful moment of serendipity and the, the, the whole universal idea of the song being like, well, you know, we, we may have given up on the world occasionally in our lives, we sort of give up, but then um, it sometimes a song can do it. You know, you be in a room full of people and you suddenly sense a, a greater plan just from the community and from sharing something. So yeah, that's the song kind of emerged out of that. 
Yeah, it's fantastic. It's definitely my favorite. My favorite. The change every day. The change every day. I mean, the next one I'd like to talk about tonight's song. The the the, the song that, that finishes the album. And what what I love about that? You said it was inspired by a guy you you heard outside your your hotel uh, window yeah. at three in the morning, and he was I got woken up by him. Yeah, I got woken up by him, um, and I and he was just saying all this really great stuff. And I didn't know if he was talking to someone at first on the phone, but no, he was just talking to the, to the great spirits in the sky, you know, and um. I've got the the whole recording still, and it's and it's it's bubbling underneath the track, and then at the end you hear him on his Ooh, own. Oh, beautiful! I love it. Beautiful! I love it. <laughs> um, and I, uh, uh, he was sharing the night with me, you know, and it's it was two o'clock, two in the morning, and I'd been lying awake half the night anyway, and uh, it's the idea of what happens after midnight. Just about everybody has these experiences of you take something to bed with you that's been happening that day and that just plays out in your head in the strangest ways during the night and i it's songs for me i'll be working on a song and i'll just take it to bed and it'll be just go around and around and around in my head and then the, the nick was mentioning it today the weird thought it's in three parts the, the song it, it changes and it's sort of like the way that your brain as you're really trying to get ready for sleep your brain starts to dish up this really random stuff that and I now I have trouble with sleep, so I, I, I follow my thoughts process. And I was told to actually say somebody by a doctor gave me some advice, which occasionally works, to um, just say in your brain, say over and over in your thoughts, um, I don't know what my next thought is. I don't know what my next thought is. I don't know what my next thought is, and it kind of stops you getting to a new thought. Um, and then she said, if you can get that, and it starts to like a mantra, then start looking at the colors behind your eyes. And then, and I, and I do that. I was doing that anyway, but this was quite a good. And I associate, when I see a lot of blue behind my eyes, I think, oh, okay, I'm getting close to sleep now. And um, there's times where it's maddeningly hard to get to the blue, but then, the, then it suddenly I'll get this ah big explosion of blue and then it'll just be all these patternings and stuff. And I'm singing, and I'm saying, I don't know what my next thought is. And then it does quiet my mind. Didn't the other night, mind you. I was, I saw a lot of blue and I still couldn't sleep. But, um, yeah, I don't, I'm just going around the periphery of my nighttime experience. But there's something about the thoughts, the certain thoughts. Sometimes you find yourself being, whenever you become conscious of your thoughts, you're, you're getting further away from sleep again. But then you go, okay, those are good random thoughts, though, because they're really fucked up. And, um, you know, when they get really strange, you know you're quite close to sleep too. I think. Yeah, but, but you know, to be sure that the conscious recognition is what then brings you back to consciousness. Well, it does. It does. Yeah, I have you to know, shut uh, out again. Like oh, I suddenly became conscious of that. It's very so frustrating. Thought. Yeah, I I often I mean that that that's the beauty of night song is that it it encapsulates, you know. When it hits that chorus, here we go again. Night song, you know, like it just, you know, <laughs> sung stock tunes stuck in my brain. Just, uh, you know, just the constant cycle of, you know, some sort of Disney esque kind of early like Dumbo cartoon of the. If I remember the the pink elephants from Dumbo when the, the, the alcohol they're de- trying to describe alcohol and um. But uh, you know, look, I find in my, the the most one of the best imaginings is if you remember the scene in train spotting where the character the main character in has in, has has taken heroin or an, an opiate uh where he's lying on the carpet and then the carpet he's starts down. to sink and he goes down into this into this sinking kind of like watching the 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 ground above him go go up and if 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 i imagine that but before I get to that stage, I actually imagine the last couple of strokes before uh, to, to 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 sort of find yourself where you are on a wave, and there's nobody else going for it, and you suddenly realise it's your own, and you're just on the last couple of strokes. Uh, so you're visualising some sort of physical thing that distracts you from any of the. Um, metaphors or music or musical notes or practice if you're just thinking about a visualization of 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 of, of a pleasurable thing that does actually re- like, requires sounds like, timing sounds like and the then quite busy thinking of all of that 
<laughs> so you are visualizing. And then when you realize you're actually like on that plane, then think about the guy sinking into the carpet oh, and just in a bed. Ah, oh. and that, <laughs> that's like my a, secret. It does work. work for me. Um, it works. I'll look for the color blue. Color blue is great. I know, I know that one as well. But that also means that there's a, there is there a light source in your room at that point? No, no, it's just, it's just yeah. you know, mate, I, I got, um, there was one night, there's some combination of edible marijuana and there's one particular sleeping pill that creates, I mean, um, and I don't, this is, I don't, don't get the wrong idea. I'm not like, this is not a normal thing, but, but I had once occasion to have a bit of edible marijuana and, um, it, whether it was a lorazepam or something, one of those things, and I went to sleep. And then I got the most amazing um, imagery behind my eyes. That was next level stuff. Right. It was like um, it, it's like a like a Islamic patterns, you know, like in oh, a, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they were just extraordinarily beautiful. And then I was seeing medieval mm. scenes, like Bruegel painting or something, or a you oh. know Hieronymus Bosch, or just like yeah, a, just yeah, yeah, extraordinary. And a, it, I didn't really want to go to sleep because I was getting so much good. Good stuff. It was too good. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing that graphic nature of, say, Islamic uh, lineage, li linear graphics that you know, obviously, you'd see on tiles or yeah. or, or just the pattern making. Those, uh, there's a lot of that contained in the electricity in the actual shut off, like when your eyes are mm. closed and and you actually then pull focus on your eyes and you and you are concentrating on the the electrical vi, what your eyes are still seeing that is contained in the electricity of your cognitive they do take on those islamic yeah i mean they've come from somewhere those, haven't they, they, haven't they, they? they they've got those patterns from somewhere they're not absolutely uh, i not i totally really believe random. that that is that uh, like a mystic uh uh meditative subconscious yeah. thing that it, most definitely well the psychedelia is generally kind of and the, you know the the nature of things when you're seeing with a psychedelic eye um the way that nature is created you see those patterns that you don't see in everyday life and <laughs> yeah sky has a kind of a, a, a tapestry uh, has a kind of a texture it may actually just be your eyes i doubt the sky's always got the texture that you can see but the interconnections of so anyway, we've gotten quite into quite um, l lateral thoughts here. I don't know if you, this was where you intended to go, Mark, but no, no, it's all good. Yeah, we should know what you've just discussed the past few nights. Because we've been having a real terrible time sleeping with cold, but I'll take them all on board. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. What I love, what I love about that song is there's some random guy walking about, not knowing that there's a whole song inspired yeah. um, that's on a new credit house I know. if i could find him i would give him a credit um because i don't know who he is and i don't know how to find him so if he turns up i'll 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 definitely acknowledge him um but i don't know i wouldn't know where to start because it was just a random thing on a hollywood street with a street guy and um i didn't see him i didn't ever saw him i just just heard him well credit house have released seven albums prior to gravity stars so wow. i'm not going to mention everyone i'm going to mention some and when I mention it, if you, if you can just tell me briefly what first comes into your head when I mention the album. So we'll start off with Woodface. Uh, well, the cover, thing is, Nick, see, Nick, Nick did a um, whole series of, drawing, of drawings and sketches and things for a potential collage style cover and bought them over. I remember the day quite clearly, bought them over for us to look at after he'd been quite a while. And it was deadlines looming, as always. Um, and Paul and I were both there, and we looked at them all, and I said, "Yeah, there's lots of cool stuff." And then we just pointed to the wood face. It was small; it was only a little thing that he'd done. It was only part of a bigger thing. We went, "There it is. That's the cover." And <laughs> bang! And it was it's like, and like that scene. Wood, you'd called that one wood face, hadn't you? Yeah. Yeah. That title and cover, and one bang. There's the title done. <laughs> title and cover, and all we did was add a few um, little. The hints of stars through the eyes, which uh, was just to give the idea of the universe out there somewhere, and um, it was bang, it was done. Yeah, it was like that scene in uh, Call Me Genius with Tony Hancock, you know, or the Rebel, as it was known in uh, the UK, um, where he's talking to a, a fellow painter, and the painter, the fellow painter's got all these beautiful landscapes and still lifes, and he's 
in his studio and 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 um, Tony Hancock's looking at them and he comes up to one and he looks in the far right hand corner of the picture and it's an area of the painting that's about this big and he says there's your painting mate there's your painting <laughs> <laughs> no it's a great album it's my, my favorite credit of the house album um next one together alone uh well together alone was us heading into the wilderness to try and become a you know a a, a more expansive um band based on the fact we'd learned how to jam together and we were interested in pushing the side and we chose youth as a producer predominantly because we thought he'll have a completely different approach um and it'll be interesting and it'll push us into some new areas so we all we all set sail to the you know the west coast of new zealand and lugged a mixing console up a steep hill uh with a big team of of uh, of us and made quite a lot of extra effort to get a recording situation in a very remote and uh, quite a while elemental place. So it, it had an effect on the record, and I think it is the kind of... Uh, people have said to me that love that record that it'll never sound better than when you're driving down the Carry Carry Road uh, down towards mm. where we made it. It has a real sense of place about it. Mm. Uh, actually, strangely enough, you can't do that at the moment. It's blocked off the road. It got smashed by a flood. So the Carry Carry Road's been out of bounds for about a year oh. for any of you any of you uh you know aficionados who want to go and experience carry carry it's out of bounds it's another fantastic album especially catherine we is a personal favorite on that uh, hey. on that album um time on earth um begun as in, in the aftermath of losing our dear friend paul and nick and i started to reconnect um well were drawn to reconnect after that um, and make music together and, you know, to pay some homage and have some kind of ritual to, you know, make, you know, to make any sense of it. And um, then it just grew into a, into a, to the motivation for a band again, you know, to make the band come alive in some form. Um, so it, it, it has a, I think there's a sadness running through that album and I've heard, and I've listened to bits and pieces of it. There's some, there's some pretty good stuff on there, but, has a little bit of a sad thread. There's a song, um, Lost Island, um, from, from those sessions. You know, I'm, I was always amazed how that just was buried away on a B-side and it wasn't included on the album. I, I think you're right. It, it deserved to be on the record, yeah. Um, I don't know why it didn't make it. Um, something had to give, and for some reason I thought that we maybe had a an over an overabundance of slower songs, and I, I'd probably sacrificed that for a an up song, which is actually a bit of a trap that you fall into. You think, oh, you've got to get the balance right. But, yeah, I'm really fond of that song. We actually had a Welsh choir come in and sing on it as well. Which, And we did it. We did them in the church. We lived in a church house for a while in Bar- just out of Bath. And um, they came in. It was a really special day. Uh, Ethan set up the mics, and we had these guys, Welsh choir, come in. Yeah. But I'm fond of that. I've performed it a bit live, a little bit. Um, Have you? I'd love to hear it live. It's Only amazing. solo, not not with the band. We 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 often play English Trees. It's it, which is a, oh, yeah. a gorgeous song, beautiful recording. I'm going to put this on the spot. I'm going to make a playlist. If I was to choose five songs by Credit House, five songs that if people wanted to understand the music of Credit House, what are the five songs that should be on it? Oh my God! Fall at your feet. Um. I mean, you don't need to put Don't Dream It's Over on there because people know that one already. Um, uh, I wonder if Amst- Amsterdam, do, do you, would you rate uh, yeah, that, Neil? That's quite a, ni- a nice inspired choice. Yeah, that. Um, and there was somebody mentioning the other day that I thought, oh, yeah, that's quite good memory, memory work. Um, I'd put uh, uh, show, show Me The Way from... Dreamers are waiting. Became a real favorite. Yeah, that yeah, one. yeah. That's really good. God, that turned out well. Um, we better put one that's kind of um, up tempo. I uh, just oh. put balance. Yeah, then it was, I was going to say into temptation maybe, or something. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yep. I'm fond of that one. Oh my God, we've got a lot of songs. Um, sure, they're all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah oh, they're all good. Maybe into temptation. <laughs> All good choices. And you too, recently covers 
you two recently covered Don't Dream It's Over at the Sphere in Las yeah, Vegas. Did, yeah, yeah. I did it two or three times, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. Lovely to see people breaking it out. Um, it was nice to hear. Bono was obviously not saying, yeah, it was hard to say anything about the world at the moment, and even for Bono, and he's been good at that over the years, you know, having something to say. <laughs> but he he saw that one as an opportunity to not say too much, but just reiterate how important freedom was because that opening, you know, it's got the oh, the preamble, uh, yeah, yeah. So that was quite nice. I like the fact mm. that he, they don't they not only pay, played it for maybe for its musical reasons, but he thought that it had some sentiment that was. Mm. of how he was feeling about things which is really nice you know you know your way around songs and melodies and lyrics Neil. but what's more important when you're writing songs a great melody or a great lyric well if i had to choose i'd say a great melody but uh, i mean they're both obviously super important but um but sometimes i don't think a good lyric's possible without a good melody and that's just my spin on it i think there are great lyricists who write in certain idioms where the melody is is just a vehicle to secondary consideration and they borrow from some traditional forms to get that lyric across I, i'm not a, that kind of writer i kind of don't consider a lyrics worth considering <laughs> if that makes sense uh unless it's attached to a lovely melody or a, or it's going to get you to a lovely melody you know and the point the point at which i can embark in that regard is that the the lyric informs the groove of the song or the or the or, the, or what's going to actually create the punctuation to actually, you know, for me to arrive at where I'm underpinning, you know, the melody with the right note, hopefully the right notes, uh, but also the groove, the, the the spaces in between those notes. Uh, so that's where the lyric is absolutely essential to the way that words skip off the palate and form an actual rhythm. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I consider the music, the, the words are serving the melody, really, I guess. What's what's the worst lyric that somebody's misinterpreted of one of your songs that you've ever heard? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry, what's your worst lyric, Neil? Come on. <laughs> I, know, but what, I know what you mean. It's like somebody's mother. They thought I'm singing one thing and I'm actually singing something else. Um, oh, I can't really remember. I know there's been a couple of good ones, but... Uh, Oh, now you've just put me on the spot. I can't think of them. Um, Fire, you lit my spunk. <laughs> what? <laughs> I remember this young, young girl saying that to you one time about, oh, my, my ear pod just oh, dropped out. But warm. No. Um, was it at the opening line of, um, oh, what is it? Uh, I lit my spark. That that fire. Uh, Oh no! Fire. I am not fire afraid. Of, I'm not afraid of the dark. Yeah, <laughs> that would light my sun. spunk. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Distant sun. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I thought you were going to say when you come. Oh, wow! <laughs> that's it's had some mileage on stage with, you know, Liam and Alroy pretending <laughs> to be horrified at Dad having written a song with a title like that. But I, I was fully aware that that had a that had a. Um, you know, an, an underpinning of uh, a slightly lewd underpinning, but um, it's not really about that in my mind. It's more about sort of the, uh, you know, creation and uh, the the arrival of great inspiration. That's what I was thinking about. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's also filthy, and uh, so is the whole. <laughs> So was the Little <laughs> Low Men title. So there it goes on that record. So it's perfect. <laughs> All right. The band will be touring the UK and Ireland in June uh, with an exclusive show at Shepherd's Bush Empire for the album launch. Um, so how much are you looking forward to the shows and uh, getting out there and playing the new songs? It's going to be amazing. Like the, We know this album is going to be great to play. We've played some of these songs on an American tour already and they just, they just really... Um, they leap forward, you know, and uh, all that work that you do in organising and arranging things during record and in the convoluted pathways that you get to, you get to an arrangement that's just really enjoyable to, you know, everything fits together like a Swiss watch, you know. Um, so it's going to be great. And, you know, the, the nature of the audience is really over here. I mean, we enjoy our audiences everywhere, but there's some kind of special thing that goes on in Ireland and England that and Scotland, and Wales. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the UK. 
the UK <laughs> and Ireland. Um, <laughs> you've got to be, you've got to make sure you don't forget anybody. Um, uh, some kind of intensity in the in the crowds about the history of the band and people sing really well and you know I don't know it's really enjoyable place to play. I like to ask my guests the following questions. For us music fans, music is the soundtrack to our memories. So what song or album, when you listen to it, brings back the best memories for you? Oh, there's a few, isn't there, really, for me. But um, I listen to, I, you know, Carol King's Tapestry does it for me every time because that was a huge record on us. And it's, I was learning how to play piano at the time, so I learned her songs, and they taught me so much about harmony and other variations of chords that I knew nothing about. So. When I hear that song, that album now, I just get really transported um, back to that time. Makes me remember what I felt like when I was 14. What about you, Nick? I think <clears throat> David Bowie's Low. Uh, and I, I kind of, when that record came out, I, I, I suddenly realised I'd, I'd gained a, a new sense of independence uh in regard what i thought what, what what were different from my family's what were imposed on me by my family uh what was significant like i stopped going to church i was working in a petrol station i decided to leave secondary school before graduating and enrolling in a tertiary institution to follow uh, 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 you know, art school. My father st had stopped talking to me by this stage, uh, and then I moved out of home. And Low was sort of the record that that um, was on the. I found that an incredible record, and it still does. Uh, and it's the B side that does it for me, as opposed to uh, the the actual kind of that, singles. What, that Warsawa, what's that? The slow one. Warsawa, yeah, yeah. That's I oh. saw. I saw Bowie on that record. That, uh, and at Earl's Court wow. in London, and that's wow. what he started the the show with, right? That song it yeah. was really amazing, actually. Yeah. If you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career, what would it be? I, I uh, you'd, you'd assume that we'd probably say the farewell concert at the at the, the Sydney Opera House, but no, um, that's been relived. Oh, shit, sure, that's a hard question. What do you think, Nick? Relive, relive, relive a for, musical moment to, to re-experience that musical moment, or even go back and change something. All right, well, I, okay, you know, after a show in Austin, in in Houston, Texas, I ended up in a a, 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 a far too powerful muscle car with a extraordinarily bent character on ecstasy handing me a medusa a can of this thing called ethyl nitrate uh that was a, a 20 second hallucinogenic uh spray can uh, i was with these two other people and i had to hide the can while we were driving along uh the, this this highway at excessive speed and i'm in the passenger seat and i'm the only one not completely out of my mind and uh I was absolutely oh. terrified, and I just wished I had not agreed to leave the thing that I was with just to ride in this guy's car because I was impressed with the car. It was a, it's funny a that 1985 that's... Corvette. Um, anyway, yeah. Funny that you made that your your musical experience that you. No, I know. <laughs> it was because I was in <laughs> in crowded <laughs> house, and I was in um, it Dallas. I think a, it was Dallas a night from in Belfast. Where, where are you from, Mark? Belfast. Oh yeah, I was going to say. Um, made me think of a night in Belfast years ago. Similar thing happened to me where I was. Uh, the guy came backstage and he was very pushy and kind of. But he seemed to. He said, "Ah, oh, I'll take you take you out in the back." I'm not going to try and do a Belfast accent, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take you out. I've got a motorbike. I'll take you out in the morning and I'll show you around because we were leaving at about ten or something. Oh, I'll pick you up at you know and um show you around. I went. Oh, I, I would never probably normally say no. It's okay, but I went. Oh as well he picked me up at about 6 30 just getting light and we drove at probably 120 miles an hour oh. along the one motorway that leads slightly out of town up into some hills near the water yeah yeah and um i was so fucking so and it was freezing cold and i was not adequately dressed so it was like really uh i thought oh, i was no. in my life at that point and then we got up to the and i remember i don't know if it actually was what i imagined but I, we got up to this was at the you know the height of the troubles we're on we played mm -hmm. in 
Belfast. Yeah. When the troubles were still pretty much because yeah. British paramilitaries walking, we got off stage, walked out of the door, and there's four paramilitaries walking around the corner towards us, you know, with their mm-hmm. guns poised and the old Europa hotels boarded up and that's only a week since the last time it was bombed. And, you know, so we, we, it wasn't like, I'm not saying we, it's anything like conjuring up what it was like to live there, but it was quite confronting at the time. It was definitely, mm-hmm. uh, so he took me out and we ended up at the top of this road by the, out in the wilderness somewhere. And there was these guys in a van that there was no apparent reason for them being there. And and that and it just some, looked kind of wrong. Something something's wrong with it. And as we rode by mm-hmm. them, he he went, Sean, Sean, and gave him a wave and looked like we were going to stop. And I went, Oh no, I've got this is going to be some <laughs> terrible. <laughs> but luckily, I'm kind of being abducted. <laughs> yeah, so what I've got, I was imagine being hurled into the back of this van and some kind of. Oh my yeah, God! It's the Miami it show back. band. As it turned out, Over we survived, again. and he took me back. But that just reminded me of your experience in the muscle car. I, I remember really... you, you you telling me about that 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 yeah. later that day, and and um, I it just it just all that it it seemed that you know you 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 were really exhilarated by it, as I recall. But I was exhilarating well, in the end. I mean, what about the time that we pulled into that that uh, we're in that bus uh crossing from thunder bay we're near we were going to thunder bay in uh canada just, uh, and we just a quick note my my battery warning is giving me thing and i haven't got my oh, okay uh, no okay. no I, i'm not going to pull up story i want to hear it but i'm just saying if i happen to drop out it's okay not, it's a boring story well, we, okay. we we pulled into it and we we're on the edge of the great lakes it was it was you know a snow cap there were icebergs on the edge of the great lakes we oh, yeah. pulled up in the tour bus we got out of the tour bus and it was the, it was ashen quiet, and all you could hear is this gentle tidal movement of the lake and the you ice, the ice cracking, clacking together like it these. Looks like Superman's cave, you know. <laughs> and and you could actually see there was sort of hollowings of air uh, bubbles in the big air cavernous things within these ice shapes, and we started walking on them, and then it and dawned it was- on me, this. We, this could give way, everybody. We've got to get off. We've got to get off. And we, well, and our bus we, driver we, started playing Mozart loudly from the from the and then <laughs> uh, yeah, and then we got back in the bus and it was Sun Ra for the next two hours. It was like, <laughs> it was but did you did you know that the band in the van that pulled up at the same time were the guys from Grievous Bodily Harm, GBH? Oh. They were a punk rock band uh, came, from the United States. They stopped. They the just, they stopped just as we were getting back into the van, we, we into our bus, and they pulled up and they, they got out the sliding door of their van. Split, and they had mohawks all sort of like <laughs> down one side, <laughs> like disheveled, you know. From, yeah. I mean, I'd go back, four, I'd go back to that morning, morning quite happily because um, that was quite quite extraordinary. The sun was just coming up, with geese flying overhead. It was pristine, yeah. pristine morning. Full blue blue sky and Mozart's blaring out of our. Ah, oh, that, was, that a, was an incredible an epiphany of a morning. And I'm glad that you actually footnoted that they were geese, Neil, as opposed to Canadian geese. A subtle, a subtle but important differential. <laughs> yeah, well, guys, All right, absolutely, thanks, absolutely amazing. Uh, re- right. Really, really en- enjoyed that. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, the, the, the type and the story. So, and good luck with the album. I'm really, really loving it. It's fantastic. All right, mate. Well, thanks Good very much for your time. No. Okay. Not at all. We hope to see you in Belfast. Farewell. That's a needle come back oh. to Belfast after that last three. with you. And uh, <laughs> nice to meet you, Mark. Okay. Absolute pleasure, guys.